military historian, U.S. Army veteran, and award-winning author Mike Guardia is back on Big Blend Radio today to talk about generals and giants. This is the second in our Following the Footsteps of Generals story series he assigned us to as part of our Love Your Parks tour. The first one we talked about was Hal Moore that mm-hmm. he's written about, uh, who he's written about, I should say, uh, who you know hung out in Yosemite, had a good time in Yosemite National Park. But today we're going to be talking mm-hmm. about General Sherman and General Grant. Uh, both uh, have their own giant sequoia trees named after themselves. Which, that's such an honor. And they have their own highway that links that. the two of them together between yeah. Sequoia National Park and Kings Canyon National Park. Now, Mike is the author of over 10 books, including Hal Moore, A Soldier Once and Always, American Guerrilla, The Forgotten Heroics of Russell W. Volkman, Shadow Commander, The Epic Story of Donald D. Blackburn, The Fires of Babylon, Eagle Troop, and The Battle of 73 Easting, Hal Moore on Leadership, Winning When Outgunned and Outnumbered, and Crusader General Don Starry and the Army of His Times. His latest book is Hal Moore, A Life in Pictures. All of them are available on Amazon.com, uh, but we encourage you to go to his website, Mark, MikeGuardia.com. We call him Military Mike, but go to MikeGuardia.com and also see his expert page on BlendRadioNTV.com. So, Military Mike, welcome back. How are you? Hey, Lisa, it's great to be back on the show. I'm doing very well. Oh, good, good. You know, you're up in Minnesota. We're in, in Tucson for today, and, you know, we'll be out of here in a few, like, in two weeks, less than that now. Yeah. It's kind of getting crazy. <laughs> um, and we finally got some sunshine. We had snow and crazy weather. What has it been like for you up in Minnesota? It's got to have been, you know, a little snowy. Oh, goodness. I think the uh, daily average temperature here has been between minus five and uh, two degrees. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So we've so been, so we've been hovering. Like? Yeah, we've been hovering right around zero. <laughs> oh, my wow. gosh. So that has got to be interesting going from, you know, because you, hmm. you grew up in, in Texas, didn't you? It's a little I sure did. Warmer. Yeah, do you miss the desert when the, when the, the temperature thing happens? Well, we can get cold. Well, but, you know. uh, yeah, I uh, I got to tell you, I love living in Minnesota. Um, I love the neighborhood. I love the people, um, this state, and the Twin Cities of Minneapolis have been very good to me. The only complaint, and I use the word complaint lightly, the only complaint that I have is the cold weather. Everything else yeah. is, uh, yeah, I mean, everything else is tops. But goodness, man, I, I have uh, I've never felt cold like this until I lived here. Um, mm. I, I, having grown up in the South uh, almost my entire life, uh, I, you know, anything anything below 60 degrees was cold for me. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, so it was quite an adjustment. Um it was quite an adjustment for me living up here my first winter and taking a look at the, uh, you know, taking a look at the thermometer and, uh, and uh, trying to process the information that it was giving me saying that it was minus 15 degrees outside. <laughs> wow. See, no wonder you wrote the, See, the Christmas book with snow in there. <laughs> with, with, <laughs> yeah. the children's book. Yeah. I have to say when, when we went from South Africa to England, um, or no, Kenya to England. Um, it, Kenya, it was so warm and tropical, and you, I don't even remember cold in in Kenya. Then we went to live in England for a couple of years, and I remember walking down this one um, street in town and looking in this window and saying, "Oh, look at that poor lady. She's so old and cold." And I realized it was me, and I was like, "No, no." <laughs> I was walking so slow because the cold, it was snowing, it was cold, and I just couldn't, well, no. But you've got to think, you know, when you think about it, the military side of things, of you know, you know, troops out fighting in snow Ooh. and ice, and mm-hmm. when you think about, you know, the different wars, I've been watching some of that where they went out there and fought, even if it was snowing and icy. It, it wasn't. Yeah. You couldn't just turn around, right? When things went down, you had to you had to deal with it with the weather, and uh, it just it, to me it, it just blows my mind over the years and different battles how people can do that. You're out there in the cold. There is no, you know, there's maybe hot chocolate if you're lucky, 
but <laughs> you know we want hot chocolate. But this is this is something that brings us to uh, the Sequoias, California Sequoia Country, uh, is a place that Nancy and I did a lot of mm. um, a lot of trips into Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. We stayed there. We went there first in 2012. And then in 2013, mm-hmm. and actually, I think we spent about a month in 2013, mm-hmm. uh, you know, exploring both parks, which are connected by the General's Highway. And, um, you know, we've also been there in snow mm-hmm. in winter in January. We actually spent New Year's, uh, the end of New, uh, Christmas Eve, uh, what was I say, December 31st into New Year's Eve um, in the snow in uh, Sequoia National Park. We crossed over into both of them, mm-hmm. and I've uh, been there in the snow, so we know it, it gets cold up there, and they've had a record snowfall this year, which is really good for the parks, it's really good for the water, and for whitewater <laughs> rafters out there, mm-hmm. uh, you're going to have a really good spring season of floating down those rivers, um, there's going to be some big rapids, so there's, there's, you know, they've been mm-hmm. having that snow, and those giant sequoia trees, that cinnamon bark and the snow on them, there's nothing like it. Uh, Mike, have you ever been to see a sequoia tree before? I haven't, uh, though I do seem to recall uh, seeing a few um, seeing a few redwoods, which I know are very closely similar. Um, yeah. But yeah, I've never had the chance to see a sequoia up close, but definitely oh. want that experience someday. Oh, it's one of those bucket list adventures, and it's so funny because when you drive in. Like if either way that you drive in, you can drive in through Kings Canyon or through Sequoia Park. Um, you know, like I said, the whole both parks are connected and also connected to the giant Sequoia National Monument, giant Sequoia or the Sequoia Forest as well, National Forest. And so you kind of it. You don't know when you're driving through it. Just you're connected to everything. And when you drive through, though, you go up this. If you go from Three Rivers in California. That's the entrance way into Sequoia National Park, and you're going up from the foothills up the mountains. You're going into the Sierra Nevadas, and you go from oak trees, and then you get to the top, and all of a sudden, here are the giants. Mm-hmm. And you're not going fast. You're in a park, in 20s, you know, maybe. People slam on brakes and just stop in the middle of the road and do a jaw drop, and you need to be prepared for that. And it is amazing because you just, you know, it's 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 like the redwoods, well, the coastal redwoods are all they're related, um, but it mm-hmm. is one of those just you have to get out of the car to appreciate the and trees. to understand how just it's how humbling big they are. It's a very humbling experience, and I thought it was really interesting that the general there's there's other trees like Clara Barton tree there's mm-hmm. an Armstrong tree so a lot of trees get named after people but these two are really prominent general sherman has its own tree mm-hmm. and a, mm-hmm. and general sherman is apparently the largest living tree on the planet by volume not by you know height height by or anything but by volume he has he's, some he's thick yeah <laughs> and, and he's about 2200 years old wow that's how yeah the general sherman tree and uh, seven feet in diameter, and he grows enough wood to produce a 60-foot tree of usual size every year. That's amazing. That's incredible. This is a big tree. We've been there. Um, we travel with our little pink sock monkey, Priscilla, and she's like mm-hmm. an ant. I mean, she, she is. But he's over 270 feet, uh, it's 275 feet tall and 103 feet in diameter. He's a dinosaur. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. So um, I think you've got to go. But So that's named after uh, General Sherman. William Tecumseh, I don't know how to pronounce Tecumseh. that, Tecumseh Sherman. And um, he was named by naturalist James Wolverton, who served as a lieutenant in the 9th Indiana Cavalry under Sherman. How about that? So Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> but you know, they name the the trees after people they look up to mm-hmm. because the one thing you do when you get out of a car and you go and walk to see these trees, you look up. So they're looking up to. to I think it's a great honor. Mm. And and did, when you look at General Sherman, okay, then we go to General Grant, which is also our president. Mm-hmm. He was he was our president, um, and. General Grant has his tree now. I think he's. They're saying that he's the second largest tree. Um, the Grant. He's in the Grant Grove of trees in Kings Canyon National Park, mm-hmm. 
and is the only living thing designated by Congress as a national shrine. And um, it, which is amazing. It's wow. it's a national shrine in memory of the men and women of the armed forces. That was dedicated in 1956, That's and so then cool. yeah, and actually Kings Canyon National Park, which just celebrated its anniversary, its birthday, um, used to be General Grant National Park, and then they incorporated all this extra land and made it Kings Canyon, and it was one of the very first parks that said, hey, we want to protect wilderness, so they did that. Um, but this tree is also, the, it's our nation's Christmas tree. Mm-hmm. So it's a shrine, it's a nation's Christmas tree, and one of the um, largest trees that we have as well. Just, uh, just, I think just under the General Sherman tree. And so uh, this is amazing too. And so it was named in 1867 after Ulysses S. Grant. Um, again, both of them, General Sherman and General Grant, they were both in the army, so this is of your ilk, Mike. Th- these are these are your family. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, <laughs> this is amazing. It's amazing. So, did you you know learn about the, these two generals? Did you like look up to them as a kid, or did you learn about them in the military, in, in your training? Well. I first learned of them when I was a kid, uh, and uh, yeah, the uh, the lessons and the campaigns that they were responsible for, uh, those were very common points of instruction throughout my my, my entire military education. Okay. Um, I want to say that I first learned about Grant. I actually learned about Grant and Sherman at, at around the same time. I want to say I was about eight years old, and I was just reading the very pedestrian introductory history books that are written and geared for kids. And uh, I was just amazed at some of the superhuman feats that uh, these guys could seemingly accomplish. And, you know, I, uh, I, I was especially taken aback. I mean, even at that young age, uh, just taken aback by how much they accomplished and how there wasn't too much in either Grant's or Sherman's background that would have suggested that they were capable of, you know, these uh, capable of these landmark events in history uh, you know, that would continue to live on for generations. I mean, mm-hmm. if you take Ulysses S. Grant, you know, um, by any reasonable standard of 19th century culture, people probably would have written him off as a lost cause. Uh, you know, here was a man who at best was a C student at West Point. Um, he wasn't really uh, known for anything remarkable academically speaking and you know there are tons of us who are like that Mm -hmm. Uh, but once they get out into the real world and they put their practical know-how into good use they end up surprising Mm -hmm. everybody by you know being able to by by being able to uh, adapt themselves to real world situations and be very quick and effective decision makers you know uh, the the long-standing joke um that's related to Ulysses S. Grant and Robert E. Lee is that Robert E. Lee, he, he was the commander of Confederate forces and, you know, he was this paragon of military virtue. You know, he he was a straight A student at West Point, Robert E. Lee, the only cadet in the history of the Academy, never to get a single demerit graduated at the top of his class. I mean, just by every measurable standard, he was a cavalier and he was a Southern gentleman. Uh, yet he is resoundingly defeated, pretty much savagely defeated by Ulysses S. Grant, who at best was a C student at West Point and also had previously been a drunken store clerk before he joined the military. See? <laughs> and the punchline and the punchline to that is C students actually do run the world. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. There's, yeah. there's you know, yeah. that, that thing when people like um, decide what your personality is, and um, they right. say, okay, you are a nuts and bolts person, or you're this person, or you're that person. It's interesting because, um, you, it's sometimes I think like cats versus dogs. Uh-huh. Like cats or like they kind of sit around, they look at you, and they're like, okay, you can pet me if I want you to or let you, and they're quick. And dogs are just like, I'm so happy. <laughs> and it, so it, there is something to do with the personality of the person. It's got nothing to do with really intellect. Yeah. Right. It, you know, there's something else that comes into play. 
I mean, training is great. Education is awesome. Those really helped you. But move there's forward. a grit. But there's, there's a grit. There's something else mm-hmm. in people. true grit. Yeah, I'm going to true grit. There's okay. some. Well, mm-hmm. I think what's interesting because he he really didn't. He you know, he married his wife Julia Dent, and um, they really didn't have a lot of money between them. You know, and he no. just always kind of struggled. And but he now was connected with Abraham Lincoln too. So he was working, yes. you know, with him. And and Sherman and him swapped roles at times, right, because they were both in the same time, in the Civil War time. Sherman has a different kind of personality in, in a way than, than Grant. Yes. There's a – yeah, he's he's – I think they differed on on slavery issues and things like that. Well, the one thing that I can say about Sherman uh, is that uh, he was he was a very good complement to Grant's command style and uh, Grant's mm-hmm. way of thinking about warfare. Uh, I really think that if you look at the two of them side by side, it is a, a picture perfect example of you know two people who were selected by destiny to be in the right place at the right time mm-hmm. to accomplish the right mission uh both men were incredibly aggressive in the field and um and uh, sherman uh I, and this is just my this is really just my professional uh opinion of him i i think sherman almost had an evangelical sense to his duty that uh he really felt that he was doing the work of god because if you look at uh if you look at his early life, and I say mm. early life in the professional sense, uh, he really got his, um, you know, I think he really started to own his skills as a leader and and uh, as an administrator when he was the uh, superintendent of a military academy down in Louisiana. Uh, as it were, back in the 1850s, there was a, um, there was a school, and uh, – even the name of it sounds interesting. It was called the Louisiana State Seminary of Learning and Military Academy. Yes. Mm. So a seminary and a military academy. And, you know, to say nothing of the fact that Sherman's wife and all of his children were devout Catholics, you know, there was a, uh, you know, there was, there was a touch of fire and brimstone that I think uh, could have been – easily inspired by the pulpit that he brought to his leadership. And you especially see that played out uh, during the infamous Sherman's March to the Sea, where, you know, he, he had no problem. He had no problem burning all of Atlanta down to the ground. I know. He totally wow. seized it. I mean, he was I like, know. that's it. I'm yeah. seized the day. Talk about it. I'm seizing a city, man. And, well, and but and yeah. I'm not leaving anything for anybody else. I know. <laughs> it's like I'm going in. Right. But this, in. I want to. I want to go back to the school because this school you're talking about was in Pineville, Louisiana, where yes. Nancy and I have been, mm-hmm. and this was on our tour. And I had no idea today going through. Here's these two giant trees that we, you know, hung out with and said, "Man, you're big trees. Who are these generals, right?" Yeah. And Mm-hmm. You know, you've got a highway, the General's Highway, and this is it was so funny because we'd been to the you know the trees, then we went to Louisiana, and oh my gosh, Mike, at some point we have to do I more I know last time we talked about the Battle of New Orleans with you, that um, that was yeah. just amazing, but Louisiana history is so <laughs> cool. Uh, when when we got there, we went to a city called Alexandria, and. Uh, yeah. And it's connected to a community of Pineville. And so it's kind of, it's in between, you know, um, Baton Rouge and um, Natchitoches, but kind of, I can't explain. Everyone just look at a map. It's cool. They have an international airport and uh, the Kasachi Forest and it's a beautiful area. Our lives down so much Bayou fire. Rapids. Oh, so and so fun. we were hanging out at a, a plantation, Tyrone Plantation, and Tyrone Plantation is owned by Ray Swent, and she was like, you know, she's, she's a, judge. a judge. She was a judge. She's a retired judge of Alexandria, and she's the coolest lady ever. She yeah. made us breakfast, and uh, we, we, you know, the, this plantation's history is huge. And so she starts telling us about it, and this plantation was built. So I know we went from giant trees to this, but it always goes this way. Everything's connected by George Mason Graham, who is known as the father of LSU. And so 
that's Louisiana State University, and it mm-hmm. all started through Pineville Seminary of Learning, which is a military academy. And he served with George uh, Mason Graham served with General Sherman in the Mexican American Wars. Excuse me, I'm mm-hmm. going to get the right war here. Wait, I got it. Have I got it right? Mexican American War? Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Was it a Mexican, Spanish, Mexican, American war? <laughs> I'm gonna get to my my correct wars here. Which one did they fight in? Um, do you well, know? Well, let's my, see. Uh, both was? Sherman and Grant were. Yeah, uh, both Sherman and Grant were um, both veterans of the Mexican American War. Okay, Mexican American. Yeah, and and so they yeah. fought to. Oh yeah, it is Mexican American War. They fought together, and so mm-hmm. George Mason Graham was trying to. There was a big fire. Alexandria burned down, just like Atlanta. Mm. Alexandria burned down, and then they were trying to save the school. And this school moved from Baton Rouge. There's a whole history to that. But this is actually the start of the university, is this school you're talking about. And when Alexandria burned down, in her plantation house that she owns, and it looks like her bed and breakfast is back open for business, a so go Ray. Mm. So check it out, tyroneplantation.com, yeah. oh, everyone. Beautiful. It's awesome. It's is such a fascinating place. The Union soldiers stayed at the upper floor, and then they trapped George Mason Graham on the second floor. And um, they, not trapped him, but it protected him because of Sherman and his relationship with Sherman. And Mm-hmm. He actually made him the superintendent. They, he helped him actually get the funding. Sherman helped him get the funding for this school. So, sorry, a big detour, but um, it's weird how all of this connects, you know, for what he did. But Sherman helped uh, protect him, and the Union troops stayed upstairs. But apparently, at some point during the Civil War, the Union and the Confederates were playing baseball or something out in the lawn. Together. It's crazy. Together, during mm. some specific period, mm. there's like a whole thing that they reenacted in Alexandria. So we'll we'll dig into that on another following in the footsteps of generals. But uh, Sherman and uh, and Graham were good friends apparently. So there we go. Anyway, so that was another stop on the tour. But let's go back to the trees and the generals. Sherman, um, it's interesting to me because he did he actually. Didn't he like succeed Grant in some of the positions that Grant had during the wars in in the 1860s? At some point, he actually well, held, held the same shoes. Uh, well, yeah. As a matter of fact, um, as a matter of fact, both of them uh, succeeded at the successive commands that they had, and uh, yeah, hmm. they were they were two gentlemen who were in, in the right place. Uh, at the right time, you know, and you know, you, you see that you see that particularly, you uh, you see that particularly when Sherman is uh, commanding the tactical forces at the siege of Corinth, and mm. uh, let's see, there's there's another seizure that comes to mind aside from Corinth uh, that was that that was during the Vicksburg campaign, and mm. uh, that was actually what led to the capture of the Mississippi River. Wow, that's amazing. Mm. So this is, it's so interesting how we have the Union and the Confederates, and then, so they were both strong Republicans at that point, too, right, at this point, and well, yes. Grant, Grant was a very strong Republican, and um, did they, what is, Sherman, I know his, his Civil War career, um, is talk, they talk about the first battle of Bull Run, mm. uh, uh, you know, what what is that about? Okay. Okay. Well, the first battle of Bull Run uh, was actually the opening battle of the Civil War, and uh, oh. if you look back on it, it, it was really a comedy of errors. Um, I, I don't think at this point in the war. I mean, of course, the war had just started, but at this point, not a lot of people took the conflict seriously. Um, mm. A lot of people were of the mindset, "Okay, well, this is going to be a, a one-time skirmish that's going to." Um, happen on the outskirts of Manassas, Virginia. Uh, there's going to be one battle, and after a few casualties, cooler heads are going to prevail. Everybody's going to come to their senses and realize, well, you know, this this really isn't worth fighting over. And uh, uh, people took that to heart so much so that they uh, brought their families out and laid out picnics um, and, you know, made an entire family affair out of watching this battle, you know, from a few hundred yards wow. away. 
Wow. You know, I mean, I mean, they had. Uh, I mean, crazy. it was quite literally a case. Yeah, it, it was quite <laughs> literally a case of some well-to-do families in the Manassas and the greater D.C. area uh, packed up their families, packed up their picnic baskets, you know, put them in their horse-drawn carriages, and hey, let's lay out a blanket and let's uh, see this That's little that. footnote to history as it happens. <laughs> well, and the and the tragic irony is that uh, the tragic irony is that uh, some of those uh, families who had decided to make a spectator sport out of it, uh, they ended up, they ended up being the victims of collateral damage. And uh, some of them mm-hmm. tragically died in the crossfire. Wow. That's, and, that's just uh, like the, you know, and, the battle of new Orleans. Remember where crazy. there was that one point where everybody thought that they, the British were, you know, the British were stalking in at that point. And everybody went out, and there was, like, some celebration, and then they were like, oh, we can still have our celebration. And they all came out with their picnics, and then, you know, here it, everything started exploding. They didn't have TV. No, but picnics were the thing. I know, but they didn't have TV because, so what else did you, like, amuse yourself with? Well, pic- people used to go to hangings. And, I know, exactly. With a, with a and, picnic basket. And bring their kids. Wow, well, Mike. Some, yeah. Have we changed yeah. about our picnic behavior? <laughs> you know? Of course. Yes. You, know, you definitely want to stay away from anything that could be potentially fatal. Yeah, no mm. kidding. Like, you know, really. Yeah. But now, I mean, back then, that you're right. You know, people would go watch. But that that one for the Battle of New Orleans, that threw everybody. And that's when it was like the war is really on now. We're coming in, right. you know, and that's where Jackson, mm-hmm. I think it was that point where everybody was out on their picnics and the and the English had snuck in. That's when Jackson turned around and said, that's it, where I'm really going to get you. <laughs> you know, it's like. Also, uh, you could get hurt in yeah. war. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The news flashed. Wow. <laughs> that's amazing. I, I'm so glad I asked you about this. Is there anything I can't ask you about? Because it's like you always seem to know everything here. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> well, no. It's interesting because I also talk about theaters of war. Mm. So is this, I've got, I know some people go, that's a stupid question, but I I don't believe there's any stupid question. When you think about a theater, I know we talk about the Pacific theater when it's, Mm -hmm. you know, there's all these different, the Western theater. Is this really just about, this is a region of war? When we talk about the theater of this is where the drama is happening when they say that? Right. Well, yeah, I, I think I think probably the best technical explanation I can give is that when you refer to a theater of war, you're uh, referring to uh, what's the broader geographical area of what a particular strategic objective is going to be. Um, mm-hmm. Case in point, when we were fighting World War II, we had the European theater, yeah, and that was the focal point of the objective, you know, to invade the European mainland and to defeat the fascists and ultimately to kill Hitler. And then you had the Pacific theater, which of course, you know, was to take back the Pacific from the Japanese. Um, Now you could, you could, um, you you know, for other conflicts, you could further subdivide that into, uh, you know, you could further subdivide that into where forces are trying to gain a strategic advantage within a single place. Uh, Say for instance, um, in our current operations, you know, we talk about the global war on terror. Mm. And in that case, theaters are a little bit more fluid in how you define them. You know, of course for more than, well, I won't say more than a decade, but for the better part of a decade, the, the Iraqi theater, was referred to as such. Then you had the theater of operations in Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, you could also say that, you know, there were, there was a theater of operations in Jordan and in Kuwait and, uh, you know, even um, combat missions that we were doing in Africa. Hmm. Hmm. So, so it yeah, really Mike, just refers to any geographic place of a broader conflict. Yeah. Mike, I want to ask you this. Um, what do you think, is you know as as people who are serving the country in the military um are promoted and and go further and further with it what do you think is the thing that would be the most important personality trait to make a person a general 
Hmm. Hmm. Well, I'd say the most important personality trait, hmm. I would have to say that, well, I, I know this is cheating, but I can, I can actually give you two that I think are equally important. Okay. Um, cool. Uh, uh, Fine. Yeah. Uh, Two-way tie for first place. Uh, The most important thing that I I think would make a general, um, you know, not that I'm anywhere close to being a general, but uh, would be able to uh, think practically when you're thinking about strategy, have an exit strategy, tell me how everything is supposed to end. And uh, the second equally important is, well, for lack of a more eloquent term, don't be a mean or malicious person. Um, mm. Because I, because I, I think there's a, I think there's an underlying trend. I won't call it a school of thought, but I'll call it an underlying trend uh, that you see from time to time where uh, folks seem to adopt the mindset of I, I can't be an effective leader unless, you know, I have my boot to everybody's back and, you know, I'm shouting and hollering. Mm. Oh, yeah. And uh, I agree th- with th- that. that's, uh, yeah. Th- yeah, that, yeah, that's a huge fallacy that will uh, that will that will hmm. um, backfire on you. And it it, uh, it actually works against you. As a matter of fact, um, on that note, I can uh, I can summarize a uh, I can summarize part of a speech that was given by Major General John Schofield. He was a he was a major general who gave this speech to the graduating West Point cadets back in 1879. And and I I I, I can't quote it directly, but I can give you a good paraphrasing. Mm-hmm. I, I may have mm-hmm. mentioned it in an earlier program, but he said he, he said the discipline that makes the army of a free country reliable in battle is not to be gained through harsh or tyrannical treatment. On the contrary, such behavior is far more likely to destroy than to create an army. And it's possible to impart commands and give instructions in such a way and in such a tone of voice as to incite in the soldier no feeling but an intense desire to obey, while the opposite manner and tone of voice cannot fail to excite resentment and a strong desire to disobey. And if I can summarize that spiel Mm. down to the lowest common denominator, it would essentially be you attract more flies with honey than with vinegar. Mm. I think that's really, really important. I love that. Yeah, because if you're going to lay your life on the line, Mm. you got to do it feeling you're going into it because – you believe in the cause, not because somebody's kicking your butt. Don't you think that General Grant, right. or President Grant, you know, that he embodied some of that? Like he, he seemed to, I almost feel like, he, you know, he, he was tactical, he was smart, but he was almost um, knew how to communicate between different peoples and parties and cultures. Like Kind of like Benjamin Franklin was good at that. He knew how to go over to France and talk to people <laughs> when we didn't know how. You know, I kind of feel like General Grant was that way, that he could do that. Well, he was a very effective leader. Um, you know, he, uh, he was immensely respected by his troops. Uh, he, he didn't quite have the... Um, he didn't quite have the finesse or the grace mm. about him that say Robert E. Lee did. Um, but mm. Grant was still a highly respected leader and he, he, he was also a very decent man. Um, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's unfortunate that uh, his military legacy tends to be overshadowed a bit by some of the controversies that erupted in his yeah. presidency. Um, not, yeah. not mm. things that he did personally, because I mean, he was a good leader, but, just at times, unfortunately, wasn't the best judge of character, which, you know, is something mm. that every single human mm. being alive has been subject to. You know, I mean, you know, yeah. s- sometimes we place for our sure. faith in the wrong people. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, for him, the second and thor- the second and third order effects of doing that really uh, hampered mm. the effectiveness of his presidency. I just think that he was like real, like on- he wasn't 
like this polished pers- you know, polished politician when he went in and how he got the presidency and everything. I don't think he was this polished you know, there's something about communicating with others when you talk about, you know, honey versus vinegar. There's about just being real and not putting on an air. You know, don't put the fake honey on. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. You know, you know what I mean? There's that um just being very real and I just feel that about him. I don't know. I I don't you know, I've never met him. <laughs> but it's just when you read about him it's like he just I think he was this is how it is. And I think that a General Sherman was like this is they had integrity of who they were. This is who I am. Um I'm you know, they'll play games in military. I mean Sherman Sherman played games on on things. He played games. And, you know, he kinda thwarted people with with well, mm-hmm. not thwarted, that's the wrong word. Um he just he he played surprises, you know, on on how he did things. He he didn't do what was right. expected, you know, and I think that's important. Well, I think it's good if you're going to battle to do something unexpected. Yeah, if you were to sit down and have a picnic with them amongst the giant sequoias, Mike, with General Sherman and General mm-hmm. Grant, what one thing would you want to talk talk about with each of them? of their career, a certain battle or a certain maneuver or, you know, what would you want to, like, topic of conversation for each of them? Well, I think I would want to ask Grant about about Richmond, and then I would definitely ask Sherman about Atlanta, and uh, I, I would I don't think I would ask them any specific pointed questions about it. I would just like them to be able to tell me what their thoughts were, uh, what made them, what made them uh, enact all of the decisions that they did. And uh, you know, just what their thoughts were afterwards. If there was anything Mm. afterwards that they thought they could have done differently, would they? And, uh, and uh, I, I guess I would, I guess the one pointed question I would ask them is if they had to go back and do everything all over again, would they still mm. pick the same career path? Mm, that's yeah. interesting. Uh, yeah. Mm. Wow. Wow. Do you think Hal Moore would enjoy meeting them? Oh, of course. I think so. Of course. You know, cause that, when I, I, I think the, reading, yeah. reading about them, I'm like, this Hal Moore would like them. <laughs> He would dig them, mm-hmm. and I think all of the generals that you've written about would be, you know, interested in, because that was that they had that element of surprise. You can't do things the same mm-hmm. way, right? When you go into war and in, in a civil war, I mean, that's where all things go. It's it's you know we're we're often crazy now, you know, and you have to do the crazy changes, but you have to have a plan and you know have strategy and but have that element of I'm going to change things up and do something radical, which mm-hmm. is basically what all the generals you've written about have done that. I'm going to change right. things up. Mm-hmm. Think outside the box, but have a a, a plan mm-hmm. and the integrity to follow through. How hard is that to be a general and then change plans where you, do you have to get permission for everything you do when you're a general? Well, like, hey, um, change I, tactics here. I you guys say to do this, but well, I don't want to do that. <laughs> well, I uh, I don't rightly know. Um, I, I can tell you that as a captain, I've uh, as a captain, sometimes my initiative has been rewarded. Sometimes it's been praised. Uh, other times, my creativity and initiative uh, did not garner as much praise or even commendation as I thought it would. Um, you know, it it's a weird animal because one thing that I've noticed during my comparative time in the military is that uh, it, it's largely a function of who your higher level leadership is. I mean, I, I, I don't know much about how generals operate at the higher echelons, but I do know that even they have bosses that they have to answer to. Um, I, I do know that I've worked for some commanders who uh, admired the disciplined initiative that I have taken. Uh, I've worked out creative solutions that benefited others, and then I tried to duplicate uh, that same thought press, that same thought process under other commanders, 
and uh, it, uh, and the response was, well, no, you have to do it a certain way. Uh, you know, there's really no room for creativity or initiative here. This is a lockstep process that you need to do because that's just the way it is. And, you know, uh-huh. I, I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that one is right versus one is wrong. It, it, it's just the amount of uh, the amount of flexibility and um, the amount of flexibility and amount of ingenuity mm-hmm. that you can exercise. And I mean, this goes for the civilian world too. The amount of flexibility yeah. and, and, and ingenuity that you can exercise is largely of a function of you know whatever cultural dynamics are in play within your organization. It, that is so true. We used to, when we came back from Africa and England and we came back to the States, we both ended up working for a company selling musical organs to senior and teaching, citizens. And teaching, yeah. Yes, and teaching music. And this company was widespread throughout Florida and other states. And uh, <laughs> the style of management Uh, was different according to who your manager was or your boss was. And Mm -hmm. as you progressed in the company further up and further up and then became managers and had your own store, which was interesting, you could, you, as the closer you got to the top of what was really happening, the more confusing it got. I have to be honest. (laughs) They were, they actually had us, memorize a speech that you had to say to people as they walked in the store. Now, I had a big problem mm-hmm. with that, but um, and I kept tweaking it and changing it because I was like, I don't like the speech. It's I'm not natural. Own. It wasn't natural, mm-hmm. but and they thought that was pretty funny. But eventually, you'd have some managers like, let her do her own thing. She's selling. And others went, no, mm-hmm. you must do it this way. There's only one way. You got way, told, don't and reinvent the wheel. And, and they even made you take this box of music and music books and spill it on the floor in front of the person you're trying to sell an organ to. And I absolutely couldn't do it. I could not phony a box of music books falling on the floor. I'm like, dude, stop it. You've got a good instrument you're trying to sell. Why don't you just talk about the organ? <laughs> Show them, yeah. Yeah, it was so weird. But I, I get that kind of concept of leadership where you will do it this, my, this way or the highway, or, hey, what do you have to do? come to the party here with a little creativity? I think there's a difference. There's a difference. There's a difference in that, in, in even in farming. It's like, here's... You know, here's all the seeds. This is how they get watered this time every day. Mm. Or are you going to see how this crop grows over here and and see what you can do with it? You know, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because, you know, when you go through your initial training, Mike, isn't that um, you kind of have to start? Do they let you be you? I mean, that's actually a question that, you know, on the other side, (laughs) you know, the civilian life, we always go, are you allowed to be you <laughs> when you're going through boot camp right. and training in the very beginning? We always wonder well, that. Well, yeah. Um, no, they really can't let you be you. And, and I, think that, I think that it's appropriate just in that context uh, because, mm-hmm. you know, every, because when you're in an organization that – well, when you're in an organization whose you know, job is to engage in violence – in the defense of, you know, national security and you're, mm-hmm. you know, you're, you may be called upon to, uh, you know, you, you may be called upon to be in austere environments and be in uh, unpleasant situations where, you know, you may or may not come out alive. I, I think by the very nature of the business, mm-hmm. I think that it's appropriate for everyone to be put on that level playing field when they're going through the initial training because you know you know they 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 try to strip away the bits of individuality and say okay you know you all have had different experiences in the civilian world now we have to adjust your mindset to what it's going to be like in the military so this is wow. why we do things like close order drill this is why we do things um this is why we do things, you know, like marksmanship training. This is all to build that fundamental foundation of discipline. And once you have mm-hmm. that discipline foundation established, 
okay, well, now that you've been enculturated, now that you understand the mindset and the stresses of the job, okay, now we can introduce so now mm-hmm. we can introduce a little bit of flexibility. Okay. And, uh, you know, I, I think the tiered process works in that particular regard. I just don't think the lockstep, um, the lockstep mm-hmm. you can't be you should be carried on after that initial training. You know, I right. think that, you know, because in any situation that you're going to be in, whether you're stationed stateside or whether you're supporting whatever mission overseas, there's not always going to be a book answer. And there's mm-hmm. not always going to be a readily available list of tasks and techniques that you have to do in order to get the right answer. You have to make decisions wow. in real time, and you have to be able to think on your feet and just have a little bit of adaptive mm-hmm. creativity. And that's where I mm-hmm. think that the you know I think that that's where the individual has to come in. This is where I think it's so exciting about mm-hmm. the generals that we're talking about. Exactly. You know, how more, uh, you know, that we're following. Of course, we're talking about Sherman and, and General Grant as well today. Uh, but normally on the tour, as we get to the places that we have you know, are at, at the actual places that Helmore have has been and uh, Russell Volkman and Donald D. Blackburn have been in, um, then we're going to go, hey, we're here, we're in their footsteps, you know, you know, physically, which is cool. But, you know, in all of your books, so, you know, telling their stories, all of their stories is about how they broke the mold, how they changed something and how mm-hmm. they went for it and they believed in themselves. And I think, yeah, you're right. I mean, isn't that that whole part? And going and writing all these books, does that every time you – dig into their research and, and or dig into the research and dig into their history, doesn't that reinforce it even more for you uh, on top of your own background, your own military background and training? It certainly does. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, yeah. it, uh, it for me, it really just reinforces that, um, you know, it, it, it really reinforces the notion that those who excel are those who can retain that degree of flexibility and uh, mm-hmm. you know, those who are in environments that will allow that flexibility to thrive. Awesome. What a great conversation. Cool. It's always so cool to have you on the show and, and talk about, you know, uh, these lessons and, and I learned so much. I just mm-hmm. really appreciate it. I know a lot of our listeners um, are learning things from you, and uh, I, we just really appreciate it, Mike. It's always so cool. Um, I know that you know the latest two books, um, aside from the children's books that you write to, is Crusader, General Don Starry, and the Army of His Times, and also Hal Moore, A Life in Pictures. Everyone go get them on Amazon or go to MikeGuardia.com. But I hear that um, you have another book in the works. Oh, cool. Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the title of this book is called Days of Fury, and uh, this is a companion piece, in a manner of speaking, uh, to an earlier book that I did, The Fires of Babylon. And uh, whereas, the, whereas The Fires of Babylon focuses on the Battle of 73 Easting from the perspective of Eagle Troop, Days of Fury tells the story of the same battle from the perspective of Ghost Troop, which was the unit that was right next to Eagle Troop in the fight. And uh, they have uh, just an amazing set of stories to tell. Uh, you know, uh, as I was as I was doing the research for the Eagle Troop book, yeah, there there got to a point where I told myself, you know, I really can't tell the full story of this battle unless I include Ghost Troop as well. So uh, that was the that was the genesis for hmm. that was the genesis for Days of Fury. Awesome! Wow! Awesome! And and also Crusader, isn't that you're getting an audio book done of that right now? I sure am. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, Blackstone Audio uh, was able to uh, was, was able to get a uh, was able to get a solid recording session on that, and. Uh, I was once again fortunate to enlist the services of the all-American narrator, Mr. Johnny Heller, uh, who is, uh, you know, who I, I think going forward is going to be my regular narrator for all of my audio books. Mm. 
That's awesome. Awesome. So this everyone, again, MikeGuardia.com is the website to go to. And you can follow on his different segments with us on BlendRadioAndTV.com. He, he's also part of our Mission Possible Story mm-hmm. Series for the Love Your Parks Tour. And this is where uh, the General Sherman and General Grant uh, story came from. It's part of our tour as we travel full-time to document every single park in America. It started, phase one was all national parks, and then we realized that all parks matter, and now we're going full-time again, um, and it's really going to be full-time, I think, until, you know, we film and Louise it into the Grand Canyon. <laughs> I didn't say that. I didn't say that, but, you know. <laughs> It's never-ending, but we're going to go see Mike in Minnesota, but we're going to see you in the summer when you have mosquitoes, okay, (laughs) instead of snow. (laughs) But no, I'm just kidding. I don't know about your mosquitoes, but I heard that, you know, when you get on the water, you're going to get them, but um, we're going to come see you. I think it could be sooner. It could be sooner than later. It could possibly happen this year. You never know, because you're not that far from Kentucky, right? That's right. I know. And when we go to Kentucky, we have to go to Fort Knox. Yeah. And you were there. You went to Fort Knox. I was. You, you were stationed there. Like, that is awesome. so cool. Mm-hmm. Like, it's like when you talk to someone, where are you at, man? I'm at Fort Knox. Like, really, I'm at Fort Knox, <laughs> and you can't come in. <laughs> Thank you so much again for joining us, Mike, and everyone. Keep up with us at loveyourparkstour.com. We're busy documenting every single park we've been to. So far, it's over 100 uh, since we started the tour in 2012, and um, we're, we're not done yet. We're never going to be done with this. We're behind. Mike, uh, we've got a song for you. I know we've played it before, but it makes sense because this is about parks, and these are two national parks and two of our earliest national parks in the country. Uh, This is a song called Colors of the USA. It's about history and nature and our park service, and it's written and performed by Doreen Taylor, and everyone you can keep up with her at DoreenTaylorMusic.com. So here it is, Colors of the USA. Thank you so much for joining us, Mike. Well, well, Lisa, thank you so much for having me on the show. I, I always enjoy being a guest. Thank you. Thank you for your expertise. Yeah. Signing well, off, Military Mike. Can we do a salute? Cool. When we see you, can you teach us how to do a proper salute? Indeed, Are I will. <laughs> oh, cool. oh, cool. Oh, cool. That's oh, it. Awesome. Here it is, everyone. Colors of the USA by Doreen Taylor. Thank you. 